Hello, hello everyone. Good evening. And thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Cynthia Hansen, and this is Simon Fraser University's Cafe Scientifique. And at this time, we will give it a moment for more uh, folks to come into the attendee room. My name is Cynthia Hansen, and I'll be hosting this event tonight. Still more folks coming in. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Again, this is Simon Fraser University's Cafe Scientific, and we're holding this in a webinar format tonight. And we appreciate your joining us. Let's give it uh, perhaps half a minute or so. Um, and, and wait for more folks to come in. All right, thank you so much for your patience. So I guess we better get started. I have 5.02 on my time. Again, my name is Cynthia Henson and I'll be your host for tonight. I work at the Dean of Science office and we do this uh, discussion series at least six or seven times a year. And this is a second session for 2024. And we're happy to have a friend from our Department of Statistics as you see on your screen. Um, after tonight's event, we will be sending out a feedback web survey link. We do appreciate um, any comments or suggestions you might have that you'd like to share with us. Um, also, your emails have been included in our mailing list, and you will receive updates on the next faculty events and the next cafes um, um, moving forward. Also, I'm happy to see lots of familiar names. Thank you to all the uh, Cafe Scientific regulars and a warm hello and welcome to all those joining us for the first time. It's great to see lots of friends, especially those joining us from beyond BC. Thank you for always uh, hopping on. Um, let me begin by acknowledging that we are privileged to gather today on the unceded traditional territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, Kwikwetlam, and Musqueam peoples. We thank them for having cared for these lands and waters since time out of mind, and we look forward to working with them in partnership as we continue to build this great city together. If you know whose territory you're currently on, please take a moment to reflect on this. And if you don't know whose land you're on, I encourage you to look it up and make yourself familiar with the indigenous peoples whose land you occupy. A few house rules before I turn, turn it over to, to Jeff for tonight. Um, there is a Q&A box that you all have access to. Please use this box to type in any questions or comments you might have for our faculty presenter, and we'll try our very best to read everyone's questions after the uh, presentation. The chat page has been turned off just to keep things simple and for you to just use the Q&A box. There's also a live transcript. If you find that helpful, you can just easily turn it on for your convenience. And just a reminder to all that this event is being recorded and we will upload the uh, recording on our Faculty of Science YouTube channel after tonight. So tonight's uh, topic is entitled From Data to Dollars. It's a journey through financial modeling. Financial modeling involves using mathematical and statistical techniques to understand future financial scenarios, helping individuals and businesses make informed decisions about their investments. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Jean-Francois Bejan from our SFU's Department of Statistics and Actuarial Science, and he'll help us explore how these models can empower us 
to navigate the uh, complexities of financial markets. Lots of things to learn tonight. So at this point, I'd like to welcome JF and invite him to screen share his presentation. Good evening, JF. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you for the kind introduction and uh, for inviting me to Café Scientifique. I'm uh, pretty glad to be here tonight. Of course. Um, can you see my slide at this moment? Or... Yes, we can. Perfect. Sounds great. So uh, I'd like also to thank everyone joining us uh, tonight. Uh, I'm pretty happy to uh, have this opportunity to talk a little bit about my research and a little bit about uh, a thing that I'm passionate about, uh, so financial modeling. Uh, so as Cynthia just mentioned, this presentation is entitled From uh, Data to Dollar, uh, A Journey Through Financial Modeling, and um, will be divided broadly into four main sections. Uh, so, so I hope start with uh, an introduction and some motivation to the topic, um, and hopefully get you a little bit interested on, on the general idea of, of why do we need financial modeling and why it's helpful for people. Uh, then uh, we'll take a little detour and talk a little bit about the history. And, and the reason I'm going to do that is because the history has informed a lot of the modeling feature and a lot of the things we do in terms of financial modeling. So, so going through uh, the last hundred years or so of history will help us understand the context in which some of these models were created. Uh, and then I'm going to take a few moments to talk about uh, models, stylized facts, and some criticism uh, that in the end should help us do better models in the future. And uh, finally, we'll conclude this presentation. So let's start with our first section, uh, introduction and motivation. Uh, and before I do that, I want to just take a few moments to uh, tell you a little bit more about my, my background. Um, but before we do that, uh, we have a few poll questions tonight, uh, and they're mainly there to help me understand who are you, who's in the room, and uh, maybe tailor a little bit more of my comments uh, towards what people would want to see or would want to or would be interested in. Uh, so, so our first question is about people's background. So I'm interested to know uh, who's in the room, what's your background. So, so. In a few minutes or seconds, you should be seeing uh, a question, yeah. Um, just to tell me about your background uh, before we get started with mine. Uh, that way it's gonna give me a better sense of who's in the room. Um, maybe a few seconds for that, give you a chance to answer. Good, I think. Great, so it seems like most people are interested in science at least, or their background is in science. I see a few education business as well, social sciences, so that's great. Uh, combination as well, so great. Happy to have you all here tonight. Uh, so there's gonna be a little bit of science, of course. There's gonna be also uh, a little bit of history, as I said, and, and a little bit of maybe more social context. So I think a little bit for everyone tonight. Um, so about me, uh, I've been interested by science maybe for my whole life or as long as I can remember. Um, and even very early on, uh, I was interested in, in science, generally speaking, but most, more specifically in mathematics. And, and that kind of give me a, a sense of what I wanted to do when I grew up. So, so when I had to pick uh, a major, I decided to do um, mathematics. So uh, I did a bachelor's in mathematics. And at the same time as I was taking math courses, I also got very much interested in, in everything related to finance, economics, um, and, and, and uh, business in general. And, and that kind of helped me decide what I wanted to do next. So, so after I was done with my bachelor's degree, I decided to do a master's degree in, in applied mathematics. And the application I was interested in at that time was finance. Uh, and, and, and still to that day, it's still a big interest of mine. Uh, and during that time, I was mainly interested in uh, generating a synthetic series for assets. So I worked on field called 
simulation, or Monte Carlo simulation. And um, that was very, very interesting. And as I learned more, I decided to continue my studies and do a doctoral degree in uh, financial engineering. Uh, financial engineering, just to make a long story short, it's about uh, pricing and uh, finding new products that could help people uh, with their financial risks. So uh, did that, got a faculty position, uh, and, and currently my research interests are rather diverse, but, but all in all, it always goes back to financial modeling uh, or things related to financial modeling. Uh, I also have some hobbies. Uh, and as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, you see myself in different contexts. So I like to do, for instance, scuba diving for fun, uh, snowshoeing, some hiking, cooking, and playing the saxophone, okay? Um, so enough about me. Uh, let's try now to go uh, closer to our topic of interest tonight and, and talk a little bit about financial modeling. So I think it makes sense to start with a definition of what that is. So financial uh, modeling is the process of creating a mathematical representation of a real world financial situation. And these real world financial situation can be quite diverse. Um, so, so we don't always think about it, but our lives is filled with these financial decisions we need to make. Uh, so for instance, currently I'm in Australia, spending part of my study leave. And uh, I had to uh, exchange some of my Canadian dollars into Australian dollars. Um, so that's a financial decision, right? If you go somewhere else, you need to exchange your money into local currencies. And um, financial decisions you need to make related to that is maybe something like, how much do you want to exchange and when do you want to do it? So for instance, if you're uh, an institutional investor, and you have this question, Diane, you probably want to come up with some model to understand the evolution over time of the exchange rate and maybe find the time for which it makes the most sense to exchange your money or the amount that makes the most sense. So you see you have financial decisions all around you um, on different scales, and, and these can always be pushed to the limit in the sense that if you're a bigger investor, then this will have a bigger impact on you. And that's why people like institutional investors, for instance, use financial models to try to understand a little bit better how to make these decisions. So it involves the use of tools and techniques to understand uh, future financial performance based on historical data. And this notion of data is very central here because um, that's, that's what we can observe and that's what we're gonna be relying on to build these models. And, and from this data, that will allow practitioners to make uh, decisions, okay? So that brings us to this, uh, I would say, process, as I like to call it, uh, that starts with data that we acquire, either by observing a financial process. So in the case I was mentioning before, that would be uh, observing the exchange rate and how it changes over time. Um, you have this data, and then from the data, you build a model model that will represent um, how the data behave. And finally, from that model, then you can make informed decisions. So, so three-step process, I would say rather simple, but then uh, the main piece and the one we're gonna be discussing on today mainly is this modeling phase, right? Like how do we create these models and uh, how useful are they uh, in helping us make decisions? So, so why do we need models? Uh, one main reason why people use model in, in the financial sphere is risk management. And, and that relates to uh, identifying and, and mitigating risks. So for instance, you can have a model that explains some sort of risk and using that model, you can understand how bad things could get and, and make decisions or action that will allow you to manage this risk in an appropriate manner. Um, second, uh, investment analysis and portfolio management. And this is something we're going to talk a lot about today because a, a lot of the history on how financial modeling started uh, is related to this question of investment. Okay, so, so how do people invest their money? How much do they invest? Uh, which assets are the right one? Um, there's a lot of questions related to that. 
and models are useful to answer these questions. Third, we have valuation. That relates to giving value to assets in the economy. Uh, and, and, and these models are helpful because they allow us to understand possible futures and, and, and possible outcomes, and then allow us to give a price that is consistent with the future, or at least our view of the future. Finally, we have uh, financial planning and budgeting. So models could be used, for instance, to try to uh, budget. Um, so let's say you have a big project in mind. Let's say you, I don't know, you want to build a hospital. Um, then you, 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 you need to understand a little bit, like, what are your cash flows? Is there any uncertainty related to these cash flows? And, uh, and, and, and having a model will allow you to understand that a little bit better and maybe be better prepared for uh, cases for which things are not going as planned. So a big, a big chunk, a big important piece of, of, of what's done in, in financial modeling has to do with rationality uh, and emotion and this everlasting conflict between the two ideas. And, and before we go any further, I'd like to know if, if people, when they make financial decisions, uh, do they make these decisions on a rational basis or do uh, they use their emotions to make decisions? So we have again, another of these poll questions, uh, again, to help me get a sense of who's in the room and how do you make your financial decisions? And here, keep in mind, there's no wrong answer. I think we all have our, our different uh, views and our different feelings about these things. So I'm just, interested in knowing how do people make decisions in general. Just gonna give you a few seconds to answer this poll question. Okay, so a lot of rational decision makers, that's very interesting and some emotional, though that's good. Um, and some people that are uncertain and it's it's normal. I mean, it's, it also depends on, um, I would say the financial decisions we're making in general. Sometimes we tend to be a little bit more emotional. Sometimes we tend to be a little bit more rational. Uh, it always depends, but I think most people tend to be rational decision maker, which is, which is quite interesting. And it makes sense because a lot of people coming from science in this room, which is uh, consistent with the previous poll. So um, they said there's this conflict between rationality and emotion. Uh, so when we talk about rationality here, uh, we're mainly thinking about um, efficient and objective analysis of trade-offs uh, between risk and reward. So so this risk and reward dimension, we're going to talk a lot about that in the, in the next hour or so. And it's quite central in the theory of finance uh, here meaning that in most cases, we're always trying to understand uh, the trade-off between these two things. So, so typically when you make investment, when you make financial decision, uh, you, you, you try to gain something, right? You try to get something, that's your reward. Uh, but it typically comes at certain expense, which is the risk you're bearing. And, and there's this relationship in finance that's quite classic, which has to do with uh, risk and reward. And, and typically these two things, they go in the same direction, right? You should always expect more return if you're taking or bearing more risk. Uh, so, so a rational investor would look at these things and try to make uh, an objective decision based on the trade-off between these two options. Uh, on the other hand, you have emotions. So that's individuals uh, do not always relying on objectivity when making decisions. And there are a number of well-known biases and heuristics in finance. And there's a whole field of finance, by the way, that is interested in understanding how people make decisions, especially in the light of emotions. And that's called behavioral finance. Um, but this, this everlasting conflict has a big impact on the field because as you create model, uh, these models might change as people learn about the model or as people see new information. So, so, so this change in behavior might, might change the whole way you do modeling in the end. And that is quite different from the other fields in finance. So if you look at, I don't know, physics, uh, you have certain laws. These laws are true regardless of, of, of your emotions. 
Uh, in finance, it's not always the case, right? Because sometimes you have moments during which, I don't know, the stock market's not doing well. Uh, well, during these moments, people might react emotionally and 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 these reaction will have an impact. So, so maybe your model should include some of that as well. Uh, hence this kind of conflict between the two ideas and the fact that you kind of need to have both of these things uh, to, to do a good job at financial modeling. Okay, so now moving on to our second section. So uh, as I said, I want to take uh, a few a few minutes to discuss the history of financial modeling. And the reason is that a lot of the ways we do things nowadays uh, has as historical, like there's an history behind it. And, and this history is, if you understand it, then you might understand a little bit better why certain things are, are done in specific ways. So I would say the history of, of financial modeling is rather short in the grand scheme of things uh, with early beginnings, maybe 100, 120 years ago. Uh, so early beginnings in uh, 1900s. Um, and then after that, it took a while until people got interested. Uh, and, and then you go to the 1950s where we have a lot of contribution uh, on capital structure and portfolio theory. We're gonna talk about some of them in a few minutes. Uh, so that's 50s, 60s. And, and then in the 70s, we go to option pricing model. Um, for about 10 years, that was the main topic of interest in, in financial modeling. After in the 80s and uh, 90s, a lot of a lot of quantitative risk management coming, coming online, uh, especially in the light of some crises that happened in the 70s. Uh, and finally, more recently, we have uh, high frequency trading and machine learning. And we're not going to talk much about this because it's kind of the history being written at the moment. But I just want to mention a few things about these things just to give you a better context. So we'll get started with early beginnings. Uh, and this whole story starts uh, in uh, the 19... Um, uh, 1890s, 1900s. So, so uh, it all starts with this guy called Louis Bachelier, who was uh, doing uh, a PhD at uh, La Sorbonne in Paris. Um, so he started his study in uh, 1892 under the uh, advice of Henri Poincaré, who was a famous mathematician. Um, and uh, during the eight year during which he, he wrote this, his thesis, um, speculation theory or Théorie de la spéculation, uh, he, he, he got interested in this uh, process a uh, stochastic process. So that's a mathematical object to try to understand the future evolution of an, uh, of something. And in this case, he was interested in the French bond market. Uh, and, and, and as he was doing his research, he basically invented um, a new type of process called the Brownian motion. Uh, and what's interesting is that a lot of people think that this object was invented by Einstein, but uh, in fact, the work of uh, Louis Bachelier predated the work of Einstein by at least five years. Uh, so, so because of that contribution he made to the field, he's now considered as the forefather of mathematical finance and one of the main inventors of this Brownian motion, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later. I'll show you a little bit how it works and how useful it could be. Uh, in, in the context of financial modeling. So first contribution in uh, late 19, uh, late 1800, early 1900s, um, and then almost nothing for 50 years, okay? So people were not interested in Louis Bachelier's thesis. In fact, Louis Bachelier was not able to get a good faculty position. A lot of people really didn't like his thesis because it was too much finance and not enough math. So it took about 50 years for people to get kind of interested again into, into financial modeling in a more formal, rigorous way. Um, so, so even in the 50s, I mean, it was the early kind of beginning of people going back to Bachelier and trying to figure out, okay, how can we, how can we do this? How can we expand on this idea? How can we add randomness to our, to our analyses? Um, and, and uh, if you look back at publications in the Journal of Finance, which is one of the main journal for academics in, in uh, the financial sphere, 
Uh, if you look at papers published in that journal up until 59, uh, you'll be unable to find uh, more than five articles that could be classified as theory article, like with math and with proper derivations. Uh, all the other contributions in that field were more descriptive. Uh, so plenty of numbers, but no mathematics, as uh, Peter Bernstein uh, said. And, and, and some of these contributions, I mean, made during early 50s up to 1960s um, are now key in terms of defining uh, most of the things we know in, in, in terms of financial modeling, at least the basic ideas of, of financial modeling. Um, so I'm gonna talk about one of these main or two of these main models that were introduced in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, and you might've heard about them before, uh, but before we, we go there, I, I wanna take a few minutes just to explain to you what are what is the difference between bonds and stocks. So the reason is that we're gonna use these words often during the presentation. So I just wanna make sure everyone's uh, following along and understand these things. And, and, and as we're doing this, as I'm describing these things, uh, I have another of these cool questions for you. And, and it's about investment. So I'm just curious to know if people in the room are investors and, and if they invest their money and in which asset do they invest their money in? So let you answer this question. At the same time, I'll get started with just describing these two things if you're not fully aware of them. So so bond versus stock. So, so a bond um, is basically seen as a loan to a company. Okay, so it's um, money that you give a company uh, and in exchange of that, that money you lend them, uh, they will give you interest uh, over that investment. Uh, so it's a little bit like uh, if you were to borrow money at the bank and then you need to pay interest every month or every year. But instead of going to the bank, then the company goes directly to investors and then do this process of, of finding capital by, by providing this interest, but without having to go through, through a bank. So bonds tend to be more stable in the short run because you're promised something, interest in this case, but they tend to underperform in the long run because these interests tend to be smaller than what you would get if you were to go and buy some stocks in the market. Uh, again, going back to this trade-off that I mentioned earlier about reward and risk. Uh, so these bonds tend to be a little bit less risky and tends to yield less um, return. On the other hand, you have stocks and stocks refer to ownership of a company. Uh, so, so if you own a stock, then you, you, um, own a little part of that company, in a sense. And for that ownership, the company will give you part of their profits uh, earned through uh, so-called dividend payments. Okay, So the dividend payments can be seen as kind of a fraction of the profit made by the company. So, so these profits could be quite volatile. They could change a lot over time, which leads that, which means that you get more volatility in your rewards or your returns. Uh, in the long, in the short run, but in the long run, then uh, they tend to perform better. So for our, our pool now, um, I see that most people invest in stocks. Uh, and and interestingly, some people invest in bonds and, and some people invest in both. So I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see that, yeah, there's a, a good diversity. And I think it's good. I mean, there's a lot of theory too that says that like, depending on your age, like you should invest more in stocks or more in bonds. So hopefully people here in this uh, webcast are, are young because they're mainly investing in stocks. So that's great. Um, but again, I mean, it's always kind of a question of how much risk you can bear too. So, so, so that's a, another interesting thing. Going back again to this notion of trade-off that I, that I explained earlier. Okay, so uh, one of the main, I would say contribution in the 50s um, in terms of, of financial modeling uh, is uh, Markowitz's uh, modern portfolio theory. So um, Markowitz uh, was a PhD student in the 50s in, uh, or at the University of Chicago, uh, where he graduated with a PhD in economics in 1954. 
Uh, and during his PhD, he published a seminal uh, paper in the Journal of Finance, so the journal I showed you earlier, on portfolio allocation under uncertainty. And the idea was to try to find the right way to uh, invest your money uh, among a set of given assets. Uh, so um, very, very key uh, contribution to the literature. Uh, for it, he actually won the 1990 uh, Nobel Prize in economics, and uh, he unfortunately passed away uh, a few a few years ago, so in 2023, uh, last year actually. Uh, so so gist of his theory was uh, trying to understand the trade-offs between mean and variance. Uh, so mean meaning your return, your reward, and variance related to the risk, okay? So, so he wanted to formalize this notion of trade-off uh, and the way he did that is by coming up with a mathematical framework to as assemble a portfolio of assets. And his idea was that if you fix uh, the expected return you want, then uh, if you look at all the possible scenarios or all the possible portfolios you can create, there will be one for which you will minimize the risk. And, and this is the portfolio of interest in a sense, because that's the one that is the most efficient from a risk reward perspective for that given level of return. Um, so this, this minimization is, is very key uh, to, to the work he did. But uh, another thing that he did, and that was quite important in this mean variance analysis is also formalization of diversification. Uh, and diversification is a key component in finance, especially when you start creating uh, portfolios. So, so you want to make sure they're well diversified. So, so what is diversification? Uh, you might have heard this saying in the past, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Well, that's exactly what diversification is all about. So here, uh, uh, you want to spread your, your assets across different investments, different securities. So, for instance, if you invest everything in one asset, what's going to happen is that if this asset has some issues or not, does not perform as expected, then uh, you'll end up having a huge loss. The one way to cope with that is to have more assets in your portfolio. So let's say you have three instead of one. Well, it's better, but that's still not good enough. So you can do better by having more and more and more of these of these portfolio of these uh, securities in your portfolio. Um, and 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 Markovitz's question was, okay, how much is enough? And also, uh, how do I allocate? my different uh, asset into these different securities in an efficient manner. So in a way that it reduces the risk for a given level of return that I want to get. Uh, so, so it turns out that if you look at a security, if you look at a, an investment uh, on the market, on the financial market, then um, there are two different types of risks that are very key. So um, the first the first one being uh, systematic risk. Uh, systematic risk refers to the type of risk related to um, something that cannot be diversified. So, so in a sense, it's the type of risk that everyone has to bear and there's no way to get rid of it. And, and one way I like to, to teach this thing to my uh, undergraduate students is to talk about earthquake insurance, okay? So, so if you think about earthquake insurance from the perspective of an insurer, then uh, let's say I start insuring people. Let's say I'm an insurer and I start insuring people uh, in um, Vancouver for uh, earthquake insurance. Uh, so let's say I insure you and then your neighbor, your second neighbor, and maybe everyone on your street. Um, then if there's an actual earthquake, there's no way for me to diversify that risk, right? Because everyone in the vicinity of Vancouver will be impacted in the same way because they'll all be a part of the geographical region will be will be impacted by by this earthquake. So so in that sense, this is if you're just focusing on one region. Let's say I'm only having insuries in the Vancouver region, then because everyone will be impacted in the same way, me as an insurer, uh, I can have I can have a lot of losses that year if there's an earthquake. So so it, systematic here basically mean that when something happens, then everyone's impacted in the same way. 
Uh, on the other hand, you have idiosyncratic risk, and idiosyncratic risk refers to a risk that can be uh, diversified or eliminated through diversification. And typically, that's the thing that Markowitz was kind of targeting in, in the sense that he, he wanted to find a way to get rid of that. Uh, and, and one way I like to see this is through uh, TEF insurance. So, so let's say, again, I'm an insurer. I insure you, your neighbor, your second neighbor, everyone on your street. Uh, then it's, and it's possible for you to, to be, um, your, to, to be, to be, to have some impacted by some burglary, but, uh, it would be very, very unfortunate if you and your neighbor and your second neighbor and everyone on your street and everyone in Vancouver at the same time to be impacted by this burglary, right? So, so it's, it's a little bit more random or idiosyncratic. Uh, because it's not impacting everyone the same way. So maybe you get impacted, but then your neighbor doesn't get impacted. So I hope I hope you can appreciate the parallel here with, with earthquake insurance where everyone gets impacted and then this theft insurance where maybe you get impacted, but not your neighbor. And that's the same thing with, with, with financial assets in general. But what's interesting about financial assets is that they're a little bit of both, okay? So uh, if you take a look at uh, portfolio risk, let's say, uh, as a function of the number of assets. Uh, that if we take a look at, at systematic risk, then you see it doesn't really matter. Systematic risk will be the same regardless of the number of stocks or number of assets you have in your portfolio. If you take a look on the other hand to uh, idiosyncratic risk, then you see this is decreasing. And, and if you look in the limit, you see it could reach potentially almost zero if you have a very, very high number of assets. Uh, real assets in the economy are somewhere in between, right? A typical firm would be um, between systematic and idiosyncratic in the sense that it contains a little bit of both. So, so every asset has a systematic component and an idiosyncratic component, which means that if you increase the number of assets, at some point there will be kind of a limit, but this limit won't be zero. This limit will now be equal to systematic risk or the systematic risk component of, of the total risk of your portfolio. Uh, and, and that is very key in what um, Markovitz was trying to do. So, so Markovitz, again, was trying to find out ways to package assets together into portfolio in a way that is the most efficient possible. Okay, so so let's say you're a little bit uh, naive and then you try to generate portfolios. So let's say we're gonna map portfolios here uh, on, this, on this chart. So here our y-axis will be the portfolio return and our x-axis will be the portfolio risk. And let's say you create some allocations at random. So let's say here you have a bunch of those, more, you create more, you create more, you create more, create more, more, more. So as you can see, there's kind of a pattern emerging, right? So, so all of these portfolios, uh, they're not going below some level in terms of the portfolio risk for a given return. Uh, and, and this is key of the part of the main contribution of Markowitz is to, is to find that there is in fact this limit uh, and that would be your efficient portfolio. So so-called efficient frontier because it creates this frontier in green on this slide. Uh, so, so his argument was like, okay, if you take a given level of return, let's say 10% here, uh, you can create a portfolio with, let's say, 20% risk. Uh, but if you keep on searching for that level of return, you could probably push this to a lower level of risk. And that lower level of risk, let's say 10% in this case, is now on that frontier is now on that green line. So building that green line is basically what, what, what Markovitz was trying to do. And uh, this green line is basically telling investors um, that is your optimal portfolio. This, has, this is the optimal way of combining your stocks or your bonds or whatever you invest in, in such a way that it will minimize the risk of your portfolio. So, so from a mathematical perspective, just to show some equations here, uh, that was the problem he was trying to solve, right? Trying to find the minimum of the portfolio risk, which is here assumed to be the variance of your portfolio. That's a statistical measure uh, looking into uh, how um, volatile or how bad or good things could get in the future. 
Uh, and then we're going to try to look at the uh, minimum of that. And, and more specifically, we're going to try to find the allocation, the omegas here, that will lead to that minimum risk. And that is obviously subject to that constraint of having a certain level of return, right? So if we go back in our example, the level of return was 10%. And then we were trying to change the allocation to get from 20% in terms of risk to 10%, right? So um, that's the problem he was trying to solve. Uh, and he was able to solve it. Uh, it worked really well. It required, I mean, in high dimensional cases, some computing power, which was just starting in the 50s. And it was a good thing that uh, Markovitz was working at the Rand Corporation, so he could use other computers to uh, work on his uh, financial problem. Uh, further on, I mean, the Markovitz theory uh, became somewhat well known, and a few people got very interested, and, and, and specifically three uh, professors uh, here, Jack Trenner, uh, William Sharp, and, and John Littman, Littner, sorry, um, Littner, uh, got very much interested in, in this um, problem, uh, but, but they were also interested in uh, not how to create portfolio, but more what is the right level of return should you expect if you bear a certain amount of risk? So, so the idea was to build on the work of Markowitz uh, and use the basis of his mean variance theory to try to understand what is the potential return on an investment, but here from a systematic risk perspective. And the argument is that investors should not be compensated for idiosyncratic risk because this risk can be diversified. So here people should only be uh, compensated for systematic risk, which means that, that if you look back at, his, at this risk reward trade-off, then the risk you should account for should only be the one that is related to the whole market. We hear your systematic risk and not that related to the specificity of a given stock or a given bond. So let's say here we're trying to compare returns from uh, a market index. So that's on the left in green. And that is a good proxy for systematic risk. Okay, So it tells you a little bit how the market is behaving. Um, and then you compare it now to the Apple stock, which is on the right-hand side in, in pink. And that one, I mean, remember, contains both systematic and idiosyncratic risk. So as you can see, both these things, I mean, sometimes they move in the same direction. There tends to be a little bit more randomness around Apple stock than the market index. But as you can see, when the market index goes up, then Apple stock goes up as well. And when the market index goes down, normally the Apple stock goes down as well. And if you compute the correlation between these two series, so correlation here being a measure of how uh, how these things move and if they're moving together or not. And, and if the number is positive and high, then it means that these things tends to move together, which is the case here with a correlation of 71. Uh, so, so this is informing us that in fact, in Apple stock, there is a lot of the Apple stock that is in fact tied to systematic risk. Okay? And, and if there's a lot of systematic risk in Apple stock, then investors should get compensated more for, for bearing the risk of that stock because there is a part of it that is probably not diversifiable in the economy. Um, and, and, and their theory, the, the capital asset pricing model theory, uh, led to this security market line, which is one of, uh, I would say, key results from the 50s and the 60s in finance, and, and, and what does it say? It says that uh, the expected return on a stock should be a function of the sensitivity of an asset to its systematic risk, um, systematic risk in the market. And, and what's interesting is that if you do this exercise empirically, you'll see all of the assets lining up on that, on that curve, more or less. So here you see, for instance, for Apple that we've talked about earlier, um, you see the sensitivity is a little bit less than the market. So here it's less than one, which means that the expected return on that stock should be also less than that of the market because you're typically, you're buying Apple stock bearing less risk than that of the market. 
So again, there's this relationship between risk and reward. Here in this case, it's linear. But what's interesting is that risk is now not understood as this total metric, but instead it's only tied to the part that is systematic. Uh, and, and, and that is the main contribution of the cap and to really isolate this component that was systematic and, and, and try to argue that people should only be compensated for bearing that specific risk. So enough about the 50s and the 60s, let's now move on to uh, option pricing models, so the 70s. Um, and before we get started, let's just maybe describe what options are so that people know, know what they are if you're not aware of them. So options are a financial instruments that will provide investors the right but not the obligation to sell or buy an asset for a predetermined price that we call typically strike price in this literature and uh, at an expiration date that is called a maturity. So, so one of the most, I would say, known option is called a call option. And the call option gives the buyer the right to buy a security, but not the obligation. Okay, and the way it works is that if I have a call option, then um, I'll be able to, to buy an asset for a given price that we call the strike price. So, so it gives me the right, but not the obligation. So, so if I'm rational, then I'm only going to exercise that option if it's in my best interest to do so, right? So, so if the price of the asset I buy the call option on is, uh, I don't know, $10 and my, my strike price is $5, then it means that I'm going to pay $5 to buy something that is worth $10. Right? So I'm gaining $5, so I should definitely exercise that option in that case. Uh, on the other hand, if let's say your strike price is still $5, but the current price of your asset is $3, means that you're going to pay $5 to get something that is now worth $3 only. So you're not going to exercise. And, and this gives rise to this nonlinear um, payoff function. So here you see the math, the max between S minus K and zero. And, and I think the graphical representation, so the so-called hockey stick, uh, is it, a little bit more, I would say, appealing in the sense that you kind of understand a little bit more what's happening here. So the right part of the plot typically relates to cases where you exercise your option, right? Where it's beneficial for you to, 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 to go ahead and, and buy the security for the strike price. Uh, and then the left part of the plot, uh, so from um, the part that is flat, uh, it is basically accounting for cases where it's not in your best interest. And in, in, in these cases, you're not going to exercise, meaning that your payoff will be uh, zero in this case. Uh, so so these, these options, these types of instruments became very, very popular in the 70s. And, and one reason for that uh, is obviously uh, the starting of some exchanges in the US that started to trade these options. But another fundamental change was this black schultz merton framework uh, introduced by uh, Fisher Black, Myron Schultz, and, and Robert Merton. And their main, I would say, contribution is related to trying to find the price, the right price for these uh, options, okay? So they found a formula to uh, estimate the fair value of these uh, financial instruments. And I'm not gonna show you the, the, the formula, but I just wanna kind of show you what it looks like. So here you see again in green, this, this hockey stick, which is the payoff of that option. And on top of that, you have this gray line. And this gray line is basically uh, some sort of complicated mathematical function, mathematical equation that uh, will be a function of the strike price and the maturity. And that will tell, uh, investors how much they need to to pay right now to get the opportunity or the right to buy or not sell in the future okay and finding this equation was in fact a game changer for this for this this literature and also for uh, the whole option market in the 70s because once they had that then it became very very easy for people to give a price to these things and then trade them efficiently uh, so, so now moving on again uh, in the 80s and uh, 90s. Uh, so, so during that time, 
we're coming out of the 70s. A lot of crises happen. A lot of things didn't go as planned. So people start thinking about, okay, what can we do to try to make things a little bit more stable in the economy? And, and that gave rise to this, to this risk management or quantitative risk management idea. So, so quantitative risk management here just means that it's a process in which you're identifying, assessing, and mitigating potential risks that could impact the firm. And um, typically the idea is to try to come up with, with models that will tell you something about uh, the impact. So that's your loss. That's how bad things could get and how likely these things are. So are they very likely or not likely at all? And, and typically, if something has a high impact and a high likelihood, then uh, it's the worst mix, right? So in that case, you get into cases where uh, you have high potential losses that can occur often. Uh, so so we'd say a huge contribution in that, in that sphere of, of risk management has to do with uh, the so-called value at risk, uh, which you might have heard of before. So the value at risk is uh, one of the key risk management tools used in finance. And it helps people uh, estimate their potential losses um, up to a certain level of confidence. Okay, so let's say you have a distribution of potential losses, um, like the distribution you currently see on that slide. So, so the value at risk typically focuses on worst case scenarios. So here, you see, I, I, I put in, in green uh, the 5% worst cases um, in terms of losses. And then the value at risk is kind of that, that point at which uh, you have 95% of your distribution on one side and then 5% on the other. And, and it informs people about uh, worst case scenarios. So here it tells people like, the value at risk in this case would be uh, telling people that in 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 bad cases you should expect your loss to be higher than that number in five percent of the cases. Okay, so it gives a sense to risk manager how bad things could get, uh, and these are obviously based on mathematical models. So you see you have this distribution of losses. But underneath, there's a, a big complicated mathematical model, obviously, to get that function, right? Um, and what's interesting is that it, it gave rise to this, to this very important debate in the risk management world, uh, the Jorion Taleb debate. So, so these two uh, guys were actually um, debating about the use of this value at risk and whether it's useful and whether it should be used by practitioners. So, so Philippe Jorion was in was in, in favor of the of, of the value at risk. He was basically saying that while well, this is an important tool for risk management, uh, maybe one of the tools that one should use. Uh, on the other hand, you have Nassim Taleb, a very important figure in um, finance, and and he basically disagreed with uh, Jorion. Uh, he he thought that the value at risk was a uh, very dangerous very dangerous quantity and that it should not be used. Uh, and it's very interesting. If you're, if you're interested in the topic, I invite you to, to read on this debate because they, they wrote like articles and then one replied to the other and it went on for like a few years. Uh, a lot of people got interested. A lot of people got um, to one of these camps and they were either protector of the value at risk or detractor. So very, very interesting piece of history there. Okay. Now going on and, and moving on to, uh, something a little bit closer to, to home in, in the sense. So here, uh, what's happening right now, and I'm just gonna say a few words because I think uh, we don't have a lot of time, but I mean, I could potentially talk for, for hours about these two things, but like two, two uh, current development that uh, you might be aware of, or you might be interested in. And if you're interested in, I invite you to dig further because these things are very interesting. But uh, the first thing is uh, high frequency trading. That's a big part of what's happening right now. And it's basically just the use of algorithms to uh, trade very, very quickly. And uh, potentially, if you do these trades very quickly and, and diligently, then you can try potentially to make money out of those. Uh, another very important development has to do with machine learning, and it's increasing use in finance. So more and more people are using uh, machine learning and 
here. I just thought it would be interesting just to show you the amount of literature that has been generated only over the past few years. So a lot more to learn about these things, uh, but uh, but uh, but 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 it's getting there, I think, and and more and more applications of machine learning are coming to to finance. Uh, okay, so so third section, we're getting close to to the end here. Uh, what I want to do with this section is just show you a little bit about uh, typical models, at least simple ones, so just you get a sense of uh, of how it it works, uh, and then tell you a little bit about avenues. On, on how to make things better or how to improve models. Uh, so the most simple model you can think of in finance that has some randomness is the so-called binomial model, okay, with one step. Uh, so we'll consider a one period model here with uh, two time steps. So we'll have zero and one. Uh, zero is uh, what we assume as being the beginning and then one will be the end point, okay? Uh, we'll have two different assets here in this binomial model. The first one is assumed to be a risk-free asset. So it, it's, it's, it's an investment that doesn't have any risk in the sense that you invest a certain amount of money at time zero, let's say $1. And then at time one, you're going to get one plus R. And this one plus R is set in advance. It's known and there's no randomness. There's no risk related to it hence its name risk-free. Uh, on the other hand, we have a stock. And this stock uh, here can take two possible values in, in the future. So in a year from now or at time one, uh, either SU, so S in the up node, or SD, S in the down node. And you see they have probabilities of P and one minus P each. Okay, so very, very simple model. Uh, and, and this model is typically used to price uh, options, okay? So remember, option is the product that gives you the right, but not uh, the obligation to buy uh, the stock in this case. So, so one main issue that we have and that this type of modeling tries to solve is the valuation of option prices. Or in other words, what is the price an investor should pay to buy this thing at time zero, okay? So... What's interesting about this call option in this framework is that there are only two possibilities at time one, right? Uh, so if you think about your stock at time one, you have SU in the up node and SD in the down node. So here for the call option, we have a similar structure. We have the price in the up node that will denote by CU, and that's gonna be given by the payoff, right? The max between SU minus K and zero. So that's how much you get in the up node. So let's say SU is $10, again, K is $5. Then that will give you $5, right? Because that's the case where you're exercising that option. On the other hand, if you're looking at the down node, then you get a similar formula, right? Max between SD minus K and zero. And here SD minus K again is that payoff you're gonna get if you exercise your option. And, and it's going to be in the down node. So let's say the down node here could be three because that's the number we've used before. So it could be the max between three minus five and zero. So three minus five gives you minus two, zero is zero. The max between the two is zero, right? So in that down node, you would not have a payoff because you would not exercise your option. So you know these payoffs because you can compute them. And then again, the question becomes, what is the value of your option? What amount should you pay at time zero to get that option. So, so the way it's been used in the past and it's been, it's been priced is by using a replication argument. Okay, the idea is to try to buy uh, assets in the market to replicate these cash flows. So here you can buy, for instance, shares of the risk-free asset, you can buy shares of the stock. And then uh, at time one, at the end point, uh, you can get potentially a portfolio that gives you the value of your option, right? So the value of your option being here, um, this uh, CU and, and CD. So the idea here would be to invest uh, in, in risk-free assets and in stocks. So here, let's say we invest X in risk-free asset. 
and Y in stocks. So for each of our up and down nodes, we have this equation here. So, so for terms of profit, uh, and that relates to one plus R, which is the value of your risk-free asset in uh, at time one, multiplied by the amount you bought at time zero, which is X, plus S, which is the value of your stock at time one, multiplied by the amount you bought, which is Y. And what's interesting here is that we have two nodes, right? We have one node for up and one node for down. So we have one equation, like the one we have on this slide, for the up node and one for the down node. We have two equations and then we have two unknowns as well, right? We have X and Y. And if you remember something about early mathematics in high school, then you know that if you have two equations, two unknown, then typically uh, in most cases, you can get a solution to that equation. You can get a value for X and a value for Y, and this is the value that you can get in the binomial tree. I'm not gonna comment much on those, except for the fact that we know what they are. So, so we know exactly what X is, we know exactly what Y is. And then if you remember, the idea of replication was to invest in the risk-free asset and in the stock in a way that it generates these cash flows at time one. Well, we know now exactly the recipe to create that, which is buying X shares of the risk-free asset and Y shares of the stock. And then the price at time zero would simply be that multiplied by the asset prices at time zero. And voila, you have your option price at time one. So obviously very, very simple model, right? That's just the beginning. But, but one thing that people have done in the past is just start from that idea and just start appending more and more and more and more of these trees or more of these binomial models in a way it creates, or in a way to create a little bit, I would say more complex structures. Um, so, so that's the tree methodology in option pricing to add more and more and more of these, of these little binomial trees. Um, what's interesting is that if you push that process to the limit, if you say, let's consider an infinite amount of these binomial trees that we just depend on one another, then uh, you get to continuous time models. Uh, and what's interesting is that this process of up and down, up and down, up and down, if you push that to the limit, then you can show that you will be able to get a bell shape, so a normal distribution. And that's pretty much an illustration of that that you see here on this slide, that if you, if you have this process of up and downs, then you get a shape. And this shape is well known in mathematics. There's a ton of interesting results that we know about them. And what's even more interesting, I think, is that it ties back to Bachelier, because this normal distribution is, in fact, one of the key assumptions in the Brownian motion. Remember, that was the object that Louis Bachelier worked on during his, his, his PhD studies in Paris. Um, and these, these normal distribution are in fact telling you how these Brownian motion paths are changing over time. So it tells you a little bit about the distribution of how these things should be changing over time, as you can see on this slide. So I think it's interesting because this really simple model of the binomial idea uh, ties back to really early on contribution into the field. Another interesting thing about the Brownian motion is that this was also one of the key assumptions in the black scholes merton model that we've talked about earlier. So, so they also rely on this idea of, of having uh, stock prices changing with increments that look like bell shape or normal distribution. So that's great. People have used this for quite some time uh, in the 70s and the 80s. And then at some point later on in uh, the late 80s, uh, there's this Black Monday that happened. Uh, so, so the stock index um, and a lot of the stocks in that index too went down. Um, here you can see uh, on this uh, front page of the New York Times, a decrease of 22.6% in the Dow Jones. So that's pretty intense. That's one of the worst decrease in history. Um, and um, 
and, and what's interesting now is that if you look back at these Brownian motion, oops, if you look back at these Brownian motions, they don't have this behavior of having like huge drops in the price. They're just like small changes. So, so that gave rise to a new type of modeling that included jumps. So here uh, you can add to these little increments, bigger ones that will account for possible for crashes in the economy. Uh, so that's something that people have done. Personally, I've been working with some of these models over the past few years. Uh, so it's a very interesting way to, to handle possible for crashes in addition to the ever-changing behavior as per the Brownian motion. Uh, another interesting feature that you could add to your model is uh, volatility and, and regime. So here, uh, if you observe, let's say this uh, stock price uh, or stock return rather evolution, you see that there are times during which you get a lot more variation. Uh, so these are called high volatility regimes. And then you have other times during which uh, there's not a lot of changes. Things tend to be more stable. So these are low volatility regime. And, and these are things we observe. Sometimes things are a little bit more rocky. Sometimes they're a little bit more stable. Uh, and that's something obviously that you would want to incorporate in your model. But, but the Brownian motion doesn't know that, right? The Brownian motion is just changing like a random walk, basically. So, so there are ways for you to incorporate these regimes to so tell your model, oh, sometimes things should be better. Sometimes things should be worse. Uh, so here, for instance, you can have a good regime when things are going well. So that's represented here by our friend uh, Scrooge McDuck uh, telling you that, hey, sometimes things are going well. But then at some point, for some reason, things could change. And then you can go into a bad regime, a uh, time when things are not going well, represented by our monopoly banker with empty pockets. Um, and that's when things are not going well. And then you can go back to moments for which things are going well, right? You can alternate between the two, a little bit like what we saw here in this plot, right? So here you see high volatility regime and then going back to low volatility regimes. So, so these, again, mathematical models behind these ideas, uh, somewhat complex, so I'm not going to show them to you today, but... But if you're interested, there is a lot of math. There's a lot of good math problems behind all of these different features that you can try to incorporate. And, and, and it complicates the problem, but it also makes it more fun in a sense. Um, okay, so these models have also been criticized. And, and again, uh, Nassim Taleb was one of the main critics of these types of models, and one of his is, is, is concerns was that uh, rare events are not accounted for, right? So if we go back to what I said at the beginning, we have data, we're using data to fit models, models that are then used to make decisions. Um, if your data is not containing any rare events, then your decisions might not be fully uh, accounting for those. And, and in his great book called The Black Swan, uh, he explains uh, that issue. And, and, and a black swan is basically one of these rare events, right? If you look at swans, most of them are white, but then you have maybe a black one and that black one would be the rare event is, he's referring to in his, in his book. Uh, conclusion very quickly. So I wanna go back to this process that I mentioned at the beginning. So remember we had three different stages. Uh, we start from data, uh, we go to model. So we, we take the data, then we create a model to answer some business problem. And then uh, once we have the model, we can potentially decide something. The interesting thing about this process, and, and maybe I left that for a reason, uh, is that it loops in. And, and, and when you make a decision, it impacts the market, it impacts the economy. And then this impact goes back into the data, right? So, so here, as you create models, these models will have an impact on the data. And that's really interesting because there's a whole theory in sociology that is interested in how do these models are in fact impacting the market. And that is pretty much the thesis of, of, of Donald McKenzie in his book, great book, by the way, uh, about modeling impacting financial markets in a fundamental way. And uh, 
and 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 that concludes my presentation. Uh, so I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this stage. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, thank and, uh, you. Thank yeah. you so much, JF. That was very helpful. And that what really what that is saying is whatever decisions we make are fed back into the market. It's market driven and you know it feeds yeah. back into the data and affects everything else. So that's exactly. very interesting. Thank you for that. There have been a few yeah. questions on the QA box. Thank you. Keep yeah. those questions coming and I'll try to read through them. Um I'll Get to the first one. Uh, did the House of Medici not use financial modeling in developing their banking empire? Yeah, so I think, I mean, there are different levels of, of modeling per se. So I think like the one I was referring to was more tied to the probabilistic foundation of, of, of financial modeling there. I mean, if you look at how people counted things and accounted for, for things, I mean, you can go back much more than than the 1900s right but i think mm -hmm. we needed to have some knowledge about probability to be able to say things about like how things are changing in an uncertain world and and that came in a lot later so mm -hmm. so maybe yeah maybe being more precise here about like we're, we're really just accounting for that type of uh of, of modeling but you're right i mean if you think about financial modeling it's probably wider than just this this part under uncertainty right that right. that relies on probability and probability is is somewhat new in the grand scheme of things right we're talking yeah. about 17 1800s right so, yes perfect thank you you were talking earlier about volatility and yeah. um, how these things how stock prices actually fluctuate what are some common factors that affect those differences in stock prices? And, and is it advisable for me to just wait it out when I see the stock prices go down? Yeah, so so it, it's it's a very good question. I think there's a lot of different schools like that see these things differently. Um, I would say finance academics seems to think that information is incorporated in the market. So if you see a price decline, then it means that people like are incorporating information and they're thinking mm -hmm. that maybe this asset is overvalued and should be worth less because they're selling it. And that's putting some downward pressure on the price. Um, as for the factors, as for why it's changing, I mean, it could be a lot of things, right? It could be just information coming about the firm. Like let's, let's say a firm doesn't perform as well as we thought it would, then then maybe it's price decline because people are not seeing this as a good thing. So they're selling the stock. Uh, it could be it could be something related to, to the market as well. I mean, maybe the market's not going well and people have constraints on their investments so they're liquidating some of their assets, which puts them again, downward pressure on the price. There could be many different mm -hmm. explanations, mm -hmm. but I think like normally the way I like to think about it is like if something happens, uh, it's either related to what's happening in the market or to that firm. But if like it's just changing randomly, then something's off, right? So so could be like, again, we saw that in, in the recent past, like some asset would decrease in value just because... Um, like these these automated trading um, engine or algorithms were trading based on some information they thought they had, but but again the modeling was maybe a little bit off, and and that created this loop and that the people started selling like crazy. So if you're interested, yeah. there's a flash crash in 2010 that that led to some of that. So, yeah. but normally if something's going down it means that there's something happening, like mm -hmm. either it's bad news or the general state of the market is not going well right but then again it's a case-to-case -case basis and it really depends on the situation and what stocks you're, yeah. you're really looking at and sometimes it's it could also perhaps be a bandwagon effect like everyone's yeah. pulling out so that, that totally affects the whole scenario yeah Thank and you going back to rationality versus emotions right because now yes. if you're if you're doing it because everyone's doing it then this is not rational. This is just right. you're scared Out of something of emotion. and you're doing right. it. Yeah, exactly. Right. Next question. You mentioned something about diversified portfolio. What if I have limited funds to invest? What 
kind of advice would you share with someone who wants to achieve yeah. that diversification with limited resources? Yeah. So, so personally, like, and I'm not a financial advisor, this is not what I do for a living, but I think my take on it is that like, if you're a small investor, you should not invest your money on uh, stocks themselves. You should maybe okay. invest in portfolio that have been diversified already. So, yeah. so maybe you're, you're using some mutual funds or, or something that is a bundle already of something or ETFs or, but that way you're already like doing the diversification without having to do it yourself because you're already buying something that has been diversified for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you reach, if you want to get this diversification, I think, and you're a small investor, that's probably one of the only way to do it. Although now there is less and less barrier to entry. And I mean, now it's easy to go on some platform and, and buy a fraction of stocks or a fraction of assets, right? Now you can buy mm -hmm. like a part of a Bitcoin if you want to. You don't have to buy the whole thing, right. which make things easier for, for smaller investors. Right. There's more flexibility, right? More options. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Next question is, because we mentioned emotions and, and rational decisions, what are the measures of emotions or speculations? Is it price to expense ratio? Are there any other measures that you can speak of? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I mean, like, the, okay, so there are certain studies that like they try to compare what the intrinsic value so what the real value of something should be and then they compare it to maybe the value that they observe in the market and if they see discrepancy between the two then they can start creating model to try to explain why they're not the same mm -hmm. uh, so that could be some sort of measure of if there any speculative activity or or is there any something something weird happening here uh, there's no measures per se that you could just look up and say, oh yeah, today it's a speculative market or not. It's just by comparing these intrinsic values with, with what the market is willing to pay for, uh, it tells you, okay, yeah, maybe this stock is overvalued or undervalued. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Next question is, what would you say is the most important challenge in financial modeling at the moment? Yeah, so without getting too technical, I think um, one of the main challenge, at least in my view, is that we can create models that are very, very difficult to understand. We can create like models with many different factors, many different things. Um, but then, like I said, like you have data and then you create models. And these models typically like they have parameters. In them. They have, they have parameters that need to be estimated from this data. And, and the issue is that if the model is very complicated, then it's going to be very, very complicated for you to get the parameters for these models. So it's going to be, in fact, very, very hard for you to implement these models in practice. Mm -hmm. So I think to me, that's one of the main, the main concerns that I have when I see a complicated model, because now with the technology, you can create very, very complicated things. But again, it goes back to, are you able to use these things in practice, and you not you you need to have these parameters because here again, remember we're not dealing with fine with with, with uh, physics model, mm -hmm. for which we can do experiments and I don't know determine that nine point eight is uh, gravity blah blah blah. Like, no, I mean now yeah. we're having data and we need to infer these parameters from from the data we have, but the data is changing and so so estimation is probably one of the main the main concerns I, I would have. When it comes to this and then and then also just the data the data becomes there's much more data available than ever before we're in this era of big data and i think trying to incorporate all of this data together mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is is really really hard so so i think that's one of the concerns i would have too like how do you put all of this together to do right. to right. make informed decisions right not easy there's an interesting question on the Q&A box, and I'd like for those who are in the attendee room to raise their hands. Out of curiosity, how many people in our audience tonight have invested in Bitcoins? If you have, please raise your hand. Oh, not too many. We have three folks so far raising their hands. 
So that's quite interesting. Yeah. Any comment or, or advice you have for, for those who are still figuring out what are what bitcoins are and what the benefits are into doing getting into this? Yeah, so so I would say if you're asking the question, then you should not invest in bitcoins. I think that's pretty <laughs> much my mistake here. So yes. It's just like that, like you're yeah, and you need to have a certain level of, of literacy to be able to start investing in these things. And and it, they're extremely risky as well. So right. So so I think people like that are asking these questions, I mean, should try to understand more before they start investing in these things because they can be quite uh, risky in the end but uh, mm -hmm. again like any asset right there's a risk reward relationship so mm -hmm. there are a lot of risk the, up the upside's there as well right there's been like cases for which people double triple quadruple their investment by by investing in bitcoins but right. again you have to be ready to bear that risk right there's a question about ai can AI be used in finance, for instance, in predicting stock performance, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So I think a lot of people are trying to do that right now, like with machine learning, with like mm -hmm. all these unsupervised learning schemes. I mean, yeah, there's a there's an avenue there to use AI in, in finance. Uh, the concern is that it's extremely hard to forecast anything, right? Because there's so many, so much uncertainty and randomness around these things. So, okay. so it's not like you'll use this AI tool and you'll get a recipe to make money. Mm -hmm. And I mean, bearing in mind that most of the financial models I discussed today, they're not about predicting things. They're more about trying to understand the uncertainty around a quantity, right? So, so like we have, we know that it should be on average 6%, but there's risk around that 6%. And, and that's what we're trying to quantify, but we're not trying to say something about the 6% per se. So so, so that's really like, you have to be careful, I think, when we use these models, because sometimes they're not meant to be used as a, as a prediction tool in that sense. Right. They're more used right. to inform decisions. Like if you do this decision, then that's the risk profile we're looking into. Right. Right. You mentioned earlier that a systematic risk is something that affects everyone. Would you consider the COVID pandemic as a systematic risk? And would you comment on what you said earlier on how can investors be compensated by such a risk? Yeah, so yeah, definitely. I mean, COVID is, is clearly part of the things I would consider as systematic because they're affecting everyone, right, in, in, mm -hmm. in a non-trivial way. Um, I mean, we, we, we saw it like in the sense that like people are bearing that risk and, and and they get compensated for it. There was a lot of uncertainty around COVID, uh, but then sure. you can see like a lot of people, like a lot of companies, a lot of funds make a lot of money too. So it's not like, yes, there was a lot of fluctuations, but like that, that risk bearing was compensated as well in the long run. Mm -hmm. But it is the thing about risk bearing, right? I mean, you're bearing that risk and then like what you're seeing is returns. So most of the time things are going well, you're you're getting compensated and then maybe at some time things are not going well, but right. uh, you got compensated like for 10 years before COVID, right? So right. If, if you think about investment pre-COVID, a lot of people like made a lot of money because risk was pretty low. So, mm -hmm. so maybe it's part of that risk forward trade off that I was telling you about earlier that right. like maybe this thing happens, but then you got compensated for all the risk that did not realize before that. Right. So it's a longer term um, picture that we're looking at. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I think, mm -hmm. I think that's the way to see, to see investments and in finances that like they're typically over longer horizons. Right. right. So. Makes sense. Next question is among the early contributions you mentioned, what is the most important one for your research? And how does this relate to your current research interests? Out of the, sorry, out, out of, of the, the, the things out I presented? Of the, out of the contributions that you had discussed earlier, early contributions, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, yeah, yeah, which yeah. one is the most important one for your research, would you say? I would say, yeah, I would say like the, the Black Shoals Merton one has been quite okay. instrumental in what I've been doing in the sense that like a lot of my work is tied to option pricing. And that's mm -hmm. kind of a fundamental contribution in option pricing. So that has driven a lot of the things I have been doing as a researcher, looking into these mm -hmm. uh, 
other option pricing model, more advanced, trying to understand a little bit better how can we make things better in terms of understanding how to price these things? Mm -hmm. yeah, obviously, that's the one that has been the most important. Thank you. Next question is, someone in the room wants to know, what are some good sources of market data that incorporate that historical expense data? Yeah, that's the thing. Data tends to be expensive right so so like as a researcher like i have access to the data set that my university buys and i can i can use them as a, as just an investor in general uh it's harder because it's scattered around the internet and maybe like or licenses or you don't get the full history as well um, so i would say a lot of people like there are if you're really interested like there are packages in r for instance that will allow you to load data from mm -hmm. Yahoo Finance or Google Finance. So 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 they're kind of easier to use than just going onto Yahoo Finance yourself or Google Finance and, and scraping that data. Um, so there are tools, but I would say it's pretty sparse and it's pretty hard. So I think if you're serious about this thing, then you kind of need to go and, 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 and buy the things you need. Uh, that's what researchers would do. But I, I would not advise like a then individual investors to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't personally like. I don't think this modeling uh, makes sense at the at the individual level too. I feel like it's, it's it would be very very hard to achieve. This next question, you you sort of had answered it earlier, but I'll read it just the mm -hmm. same as it comes from yeah. a high school student. Yeah. Um, I'm a high school student with no financial assets, no job, no income. How can I start investing? And while I'm asking that, maybe you might have some tips for those high school students in the hall today. Any advice to give them? Those who are probably thinking through taking the same program or same field or doing the same types of research that you're in. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it's hard investing when you're not, like, I would just say, like, start, save money, uh, when, once you have like a certain amount of money, like, I don't know, $500, then if you want to invest it, you can start with that. Uh, mm -hmm. Now there are platforms like in Canada where we're lucky. We have some platforms now that allow you to do this at a low cost and share like fractions of stocks or fractions of assets. So I would say you don't need to be a big investor to start investing. But I would say start small. Mm -hmm. Um also, like if that five hundred dollars is all you have, then my my probably my advice would be to invest it very very safely and not be um be in fact be very risk averse about your investment. Uh, I think I think the level of risk is is extremely important, and you need to assess that before you start investing. Like how much risk you're willing to to take, and also are you willing to lose everything? No, and that's. That's one thing that when you start investing, normally they ask you questions about what do you want to do with your money? And right. One of them is like, are you willing to lose everything? And if the answer is no, then you should be very, very cautious. But right. I mean, there are options nowadays. So if people are interested, they can just go Google one of these platforms, start trading. Um, mm -hmm. But again, being mindful that, that there are some risks, right? So. Right. That's very helpful. Hope yeah. that helps uh, to uh, students in the call who who, who ask those and questions. Wasn't there a second part to that question? Or... Yes. Any yeah. any yeah. tips to share with high school students uh, toying with idea of entering this same research area that yeah. you're so, in? Yeah. 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 So I would say I would say like quantitatively strong. Like you need to like if you're interested in in this general field, I would say go learn some math. Go learn some statistics, but also learn about the field. Like go take some business courses, go take some finance courses. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's important, like not to just be quantitatively strong, but also understand the context you're in. Uh, there are plenty of talented math people around, but right. but you also need to be able to understand why does it matter and what are the main features I need to to capture with my models. Right. So I would say right. a happy mix of of quantitatively uh, driven tools, but also at the same time, understanding the general field. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. 
Yeah, I will you. pick up the last question I see on the Q&A box, and I think this is a perfect way to end tonight's session. Where do you see the future directions of your research heading? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. I think uh, a lot of the things we hear these days is related to climate. Uh, so so currently I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a project relating to climate risks and we're looking at, and that's not related like directly to financial modeling, but we're looking into uh, mortality and impact of climate on mortality. We're also looking at impact of climate on assets and the economy in general. And, and our final aim is to put all of this together and try to understand what are the impact of climate change on uh, pensions, so occupational pension, and also uh, public pensions like CPP, for instance, try to understand mm -hmm. a little bit more uh, the, the context and, and how can climate impact these things. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. Wow. I'm, I'm also very, I mean, interested in a lot of different things, but that's the first thing that came to mind, so. Well, beautiful work. Well, thank you so thank you. much, JF, for joining us tonight. You have lots of uh, happy faces coming up on screen. Thank you for that. Great. And thank well, you thank all you. for staying with us tonight. Um, my name is Cynthia Henson, and we hope to see you in the next Cafe Scientific session in April. Details on your screen. And you will be receiving the Eventbrite link for this one through on your email. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. I hope to see you in April. Thank you, JF, for uh, presenting for us tonight. In the meantime, Having take me. care. Take care and enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Hope to see you again. Bye for now.